Hello, dear students. How are you? I hope that you are all fine. We have finished Alms and the Man as a play, as a text. Now we are going to deal with, uh, with the themes, with the techniques that have been uh, tackled by, by the playwright, by Bernard Shaw. The first one is war. How Bernard Shaw presented uh, war in Alms and the Man. This is a lecture presented by me, Dr. Marwa Ghazi Mohammed, and uh, this is a lecture directed to the fourth stage in the Department of English College of Education for Women. War in arms and men. First of all, war from the very beginning actually it is meant, and it is mentioned in the title, because the title, as we know, is ha has been taken from the Enai uh, when uh, when we have in the epic poem the Enai. Virgil sings of the glory of war by highlighting the heroic adventures of the Greek hero uh, Enos. Here, Bernard Shaw, he uses the first line from this epic. And this epic, in this epic, we have a glorification of war. For arms and the man, I sing. Uh, I sing. So he, he has taken this, the first line, but but the idea is not the glorification of war. The idea is something else. We here, here we have what? But in Arms and the Man, Bernard Shaw exposes the hollowness and devastating influence of war. Anais comes out as a victorious and glorious hero after taking part in various battles, where Shaw's romantic hero, Sergius, proves to be cool at the end of the play. This is the main difference. While in the epic, in, in Virgil's uh, copy, we have, we have a, a, a hero who uh, in, enjoys, let's say, the glorification of his heroism and patriotism in the battlefields, in Arms and the Man, the romantic hero or the Byronic hero, Sergius, has been proven to be a fool. And actually, he has been presented in in a satirical way. Other thing that the play deals with the perception of war by examining two conflicting philosophies, idealism and realism. This is very important that Bernard Shaw is dealing with the perception of war, with the thought of war in itself, not with the let's say with the uh, a place of war. That's why, what do we have? We have, uh, when we want to talk about Shaw's treatment of war in the play, we have what? We have the setting of war and its out uh, outcome is of little importance in the play as the battlefield is never shown. The whole play from the beginning till the end, we don't have a specific setting of war. Actually, we hear about war throughout the play. There is shooting in the, in the, at the beginning of act uh, one, but we are not in the uh, exact place or in the battlefield of war. Even the, the famous coverly charge have been described, but we are not in the coverly charge itself. So here we have what, it seems that the setting is itself for, for Bernard Shaw was not of that importance as, uh, it is not as important as the perception of war because he wants to emphasize that what he is talking about is how people think, how people perceive war. The Serbo-Bulgarian war is not uh, addressed directly in, in the text and this is right, we don't have a specific place. We don't have it. We, we have what? We have people talk about it. We have Catherine and Raina at the beginning talking about war talking about the soldiers. Later on, they are, uh, uh, Raina is joined by the by this stranger who turned to be uh, Captain Blanchley. Then we have Major Petkov, uh, Sergius, uh, Blanchley. All of them, they talk about war, but not in a place of war. Actually, the whole three acts uh, are in, in Petkov house. The play discusses how war is made, how it is fought, and how parties sue for peace at the end, uh, at the close of it. 
I mean, here means what? They discuss, in, I mean, through the conversation between those characters, they talk about war. We have different uh, views about war, different perceptions. I mean, we see Catherine with her glorification of the cavalry uh, charge, and Raina discussed with with the with the soldiers with their way of shooting and the idea of killing innocent uh, people. We hear from Blanchley about the difference between experienced soldiers or old soldier and young soldiers and new soldiers. And we hear from uh, Sergius who has matured the difference between being a, a noble hero or an idealistic hero and what he really found there in war. We hear from Major Petkov. Uh, about war, we hear how they arrange for peace and even the treatment, uh, the peace treaty that they have say, signed, all of these are mentioned in the play. All of these things, all these details are mentioned in the play. But again, without specific setting of war. At the same time, Shaw did not present many images about the violence and the bloodshed in the battlefield. We don't, we don't see it. We have very few examples. Uh, I wish that you know what are these examples that present the bloodshed or the violence of war. But all in all, all this uh, conversation uh, that took place uh, inside the play, they don't mention a lot of things about the violence or the uh, you know, bloodshed. We have something else. Uh, Bernard Shaw is doing what? He is, instead of exposing or presenting uh, violent images or, let's say, scenes of bloodshed in front of people so that are, they are going to be uh, disgusted by these images or by these scenes, he did what? Actually, he is talking to the minds of people through the conversation, through simple setting, you know, through normal setting. We are inside the Petkov house, but at the same time, they are, you know, talking about something very serious, which is war. That's why he did not present many examples, very, very few examples that shows uh, the bloodshed or the violent part of war. Perception of war, you know, this is the main thing. This is what really Bernard Shaw is talking, uh, 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 you know, about about war in, in the play. Sergius is supposed to present the heart of the Bulgarian enterprise. Sergius, from the very beginning, you know, even before he appeared in Act One, Sergius is not there. He is off stage in Act One, but in spite of that, he is there all the time. He is there. He is there by his portrait. In, Rai, in Raina's room, and he is there by uh, by the way Catherine uh, admires him, you know, uh, glorifies uh, his action in the cavalry charge. Uh, he is there in the way Raina, you know, holds his uh, his portrait, calling him my hero, my hero, you know, after hearing that he is the hero of the hour by, by being able to win. Uh, the cavalry charge. At the same time, he he is the you know, even the focus is on Sergius. In Act Two, when the first time Sergius appeared, we have Bernardo present him in a very detailed description. A lot of detail that have been provided by Bernardo concerning Sergius, concerning his physical appearance, concerning concerning his uh, charisma, his personality, the way he appears, and the most important thing that Bernard Shaw focus is the development in his character. Because Sergius, he has been presented as the idealistic uh, hero, the one who, who carries uh, uh, all the idealism of, of, uh, of war. He went to war because of uh, the idealistic views that he, he has, or because of what we call the illusions. Later on, he, he has developed, he matured, and he discovered that, that actually what he says about war, that it is a sham, a hollow sham, 
that it is an illusion and now he is no more illusion. Now he is disillusioned about war. At the same time, we have another character in, oppos in opposite or in contrast to uh, Sergius Bluntly, who reflects how war is simply a job for soldiers and nothing more. Blanchley talks about war as a job. Blanchley, he is the professional soldier. He is not the hero. He's the professional soldier who has a long experience in war, who, who realizes what's the real meaning of war and how it is important to survive, not only for him, but for everyone who is in the battlefield. The contrast in the perception of war between Sergius and Blanchley is presented in the coverly charge. You know, this is one of the things, you know, that Bernardo he draws the, com the contrast between these two main characters, or let's say the protagonist and the antagonist, uh, Sergius and Blanchley, we, we see the contrast in the coverly charge. Uh, Sergius acted in the coverly charge, thinking as if, you know, as if he is now out of a scene of the opera, or out of uh, a chapter in a novel, and this is his uh, hour to prove that he is the noble hero. He is in, in the battlefield where he has to prove that he is a hero, where he has to prove uh, uh, all his patriotism or the chivalryhood. That's why he act, you know, he shouted and he acted without orders, taking whole responsibility pushing the whole regiment into what Blanchley described a certain suicide. It was, you know, it was a suicide, what he did. Because they have uh, swords and the Serbian, they have machine guns. What saves them was only the pistol have been missed or let's say what that uh, the Serbian have been sent the wrong ammunition. They discovered that the ammunition uh, was spoiled, so they don't have ammunition for 10 minutes, and 10 minutes were uh, enough for Sergius and his regiment uh, to uh, cut the Serbian army into pieces. So it was only a matter of chance. But actually, the cover, uh, the coverly charge itself shows what shows shows the difference between Sergius and Blanchley. You know, we see Blanchley how he talks about the cavalry charge, you know. He says that at the beginning they laugh when they saw him, just like Don Quixote, they laugh at him because they knew very well that what he is doing is, is a foolish way. He says, uh, among all the fool that he uh, have ever uh, none in, in, in wars, this one, and he means Sergius, was the maddest who have been uh, let in, in, in the battlefield. While Sergius, you know, his actions, his actions in the discovery charge uh, reflects the way he thinks of war, reflects his perception of war. That's why we have uh, the contrast in their perception is, is clearly shown, is clearly shown in the coverly charge. Or we can say that the coverly charge is one of um, the things that shows the contrast between the two characters. What else? Heroism and anti-heroism. Talking about war means we are talking about the idea of heroism and anti-heroism. You know, since we are talking about perception, about idealism, about the romanticism of war, the illusion of war, and the misconception of war. We have what? We have the Byronic hero. The Byronic hero, Sergius, he is the Byronic uh, hero, who is in contrast with whom? With the chocolate. A Korean soldier. Sergius, with all his perceptions of war, and these perceptions have been proven uh, as what? As illusion, as misconception, and they are far away from reality. What he thought is something totally different from being in, in a war. Sergius suits to be a hero. He suits to be a hero in his characteristic, in his charisma, in his uh, physical appearance. A hero in an opera, a hero in a novel, but not a hero in a war. Because war is not a place of heroism. 
This is what Bernard Shaw wants to say. That's why he presented to us another image, you know, of soldiering, which is in the form of the chocolate cream soldier. A soldier who carries chocolate or who believes that chocolates are better than cartridges, who used to stuff, you know, his pockets with the sweets, just like a schoolboy, you know, this is the description of uh, Raina when she makes a fun of him. But actually what he was doing was, you know, the realistic action for someone who wants to survive, for someone who has a long experience in war and he knows how to survive. And this is the important thing. So here, the chocolate cream soldier by itself, this title, shows what? Shows the image of soldier as a coward and as a sweet, as a fragile one, but at the same time, sh shows an uh, image of soldier as a realistic one who wants to live. Someone who doesn't want to die, he doesn't want to kill, and he doesn't want, of course, and most important, to be killed. The other thing we have, the contrast also, we have it, the contrast in the physical appearance between Sergius and the Blanchely reflects the difference between the appeal of idealism and the tough reality, or the tough realism. What does that mean? This means that Sergius has been described, you know, Sergius is very handsome, you know, and attractive as a man, you know. You know, he is as appealing, as attractive as what? as imagination, as idealism, because always the things that we imagine or we read about are appeal, appealing, and they are attractive. At the same time, reality can never be, can never be as appealing or as beautiful as idealism. Who represents reality? Blanchely. Blanchely, he has never been described as handsome. Or he, you know, in let's say in physical appearance, he cannot be compared to Sergius. He cannot be compared. Well, even in the charisma, he cannot be compared. But Blanchely, he represents what? He stands for realism. So here, you know, Bernard Shaw used this, you know, the difference in their physical appearance actually reflects what? Reflects exactly the difference between idealism and realism, because usually things in imagination are more beautiful, more attractive than they are in reality. Misconceptions of war. Here we have what? Here we have quotations, you know, selection of different quotations that shows the misconception of war or, or some of them shows the maturity or the development in, in the views about war in being no more illusioned, in being disillusioned. What a glory is there in killing wretched fugitives? This is Raina talking here in Act 1, when she heard the shooting, and when her mother told her that actually the Serbian army are chasing, uh, uh, sorry, the Bulgarian soldiers are chasing a, uh, one Serbian soldier. So she says, what a glory is in killing wretched fugitives. What's the glory there? Here, you know, here, uh, this, this uh, quote by Raina, first of all, it shows the seeds of realism inside her and shows that she doesn't really believe in all what she has read or seen in the opera. And in Act 1, we, Raina also, she says, some soldiers I know are afraid of death. Actually, she was, you know, talking to Blanchely here Thing, you know, as a stranger, uh, he was not known as a Blanchely, and she uh, here she is making fun of him, mocking him. When she saw him, he was, you know, uh, uh, he escaped and he was afraid. So she tells him that some soldiers are afraid, and he assures her, all of them, no one wants to die. And also he draws this difference between the soldiers. He says there are only two sorts of soldiers old ones and young ones. This is a Blanchely in Act 1. Again, when he was talking about the difference between, you know, the conception of war and misconceptions of war are exactly shown in the difference between soldiers, the old one and the young, uh, the young ones. The old ones, those who have long experience in war, those who carry sweets instead of uh, ammunition, uh, those who want to survive, 
are the old ones, while the young ones, those who are still wild without experience, they come with their illusion about war. And actually, the importance of wood, of food in war, is one of the things that shows the conception of war or misconceptions of war. Because Raina, she was, you know, uh, totally shocked when she asked him to load his gun with pistols, and he told her that he doesn't have pistols. He used to carry uh, chocolates instead, and she was totally shocked. And he here he raises the importance of of food for uh, for the soldiers. Food is more important, you know, what's the use of having pistol uh, for a soldier who has to wait for 36 hours without a food? You know, he would be starving and he might die. And here, you know, in Act 2, we, show, we see the, the development in Sergius' uh, character, the development in his conceptions of war. In, his, in the way he starts to perceive war, when he says, I won the battle, the wrong way when our worthy Russian generals were losing it the right way. He was talking about the cavalry charge and he knows very well that what he did, he won it, but he won it in the wrong way, not in the right way. And later on he explained, he did what he explained, that, that soldiering is the coward's art of attacking mercilessly when you are strong and keeping out of harm's way when you are weak very nice description of soldiering, you know, that they, they would never fight on equal terms. This is what he says when he continue uh, defining soldiering. This quote exactly shows his maturity, shows that he is a man who is no more uh, illusioned by war. You know, this is, uh, you know, in a brief, how Bernard Shaw presented the theme of war through his character and in the play. And this is all what we have. Thanks a lot for your uh, uh, listening. Thanks a lot.